USC football falls flat for the second straight game during its trip to South Bend. And we have a special in-studio guest to preview USC hoops. Sports scene starts now. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of Sports Scene from the lovely Annenberg Media Center. I'm Connor McGlynn. And I'm Jackson Safon. After a drama-filled week, USC finally returned to football Saturday, falling to Notre Dame 41-31. to But I thought they played pretty well, all things considered. Connor, did you notice anything different in the first game under Coach Helton? Biggest thing for me was the use of the receiving core all around. 11 different receivers caught passes. Obviously, you had the reliable Juju Smith-Schuster who had 139 yards. But it was the secondary players that really stepped up. Deontay Burnett, the freshman, came in. He had three big catches and really took advantage of his time in there. Jalen Green really stood out in all phases of the ball, whether it was catching, throwing on the, uh, the double pass trick play, or even blocking downfield. And then it was really the use of the tight ends, which is something that we didn't see from USC's offense so far this season, with uh, Tyler Petit getting three catches in there and Taylor McNamara getting a touchdown catch. Yeah, no doubt. And one thing I've been monitoring this season is the split of carries between the three running backs, Trey, Justin, and Rojo. In Helton's first game as head coach, Trey led the team with nine carries, but Justin and Rojo were close behind with seven and six, respectively. Everyone seems to be agreeing that Ronald Jones need more touches, so that will be an interesting split to look at going into Utah. Obviously, the running backs are, were useful against Notre Dame. They're going to be useful going up against Utah. Now that the Trojans are 3-3, three and three, they really need to pull this one out this weekend when the number three Utah Utes come into play. So what is going to be the key for this game for USC? Well, I have a couple of keys to the game. One of them is containing tra quarterback Travis Wilson. And winning the second one is winning the turnover battle. USC has historically struggled with mobile quarterbacks, and Travis Wilson definitely fits that bill. Keeping him in the pocket will be key as he makes a ton of big plays outside of the, outside of the pocket. The turnover battle will also be important as Utah is second in the nation in turnover margin. And with Cody not sharp recently, USC has struggled in that area of the game. So my key is going to be shutting down Travis Wilson's backfield mate and Devontae Booker. He's been a workhorse so far for the Utes all season long. Through just six games, he has almost 1,000 all-purpose yards and eight touchdowns already. 5'11", 212. He's a boulder, so he just runs straight through tackles instead of dancing around. He doesn't have the quick feet to do any spin moves. He's real, uh, just a power back. So USC's really going to need to wrap up well if they want to contain the run. Yeah, I mean, the Trojans were obviously unable to slow down the run game against Notre Dame, and it really came back to bite them. So it's definitely going to be a key going into Utah. So I'm now joined by Paolo Ugetti to take a closer look inside the matchup. So Paolo, I talked a little bit about Devontae Booker, but what makes him dangerous is the way Utah uses him in this read option type offense. So right here we have a shot about the game from Oregon where Travis Wilson keeps it on the burst. Walk us through this play. Yeah, so you know, Devontae Booker is one of the top three uh, running backs in the Pac-12, but Utah also uses him as a decoy at sometimes, running that play uh, the read option at the point of attack. You know, uh, you, Travis Wilson acts like he's going to hand the ball off to him, and you see all the defenders are keyed in on Devontae Booker. All of them are watching him, and so what, what Travis Wilson does is he keeps the ball, seeing that all the defenders are looking at Booker, and takes it through here, finds a hole, and goes for long gain. So. Whether they hand off the ball to him or Wilson keeps it, they do a good job of executing the play option. So obviously you see all the linebackers queuing in there on Booker. But here's another shot we have from the Oregon game where some of the Ducks saw the necessary adjustments that they needed to make and stopped Booker for a two-yard loss. What's the difference here from the defense? Yeah, this is a good blueprint for USC to follow when, when they face the Utes on Saturday because, as you see, Wilson kind of holds it a little longer here. And... You have all your bases covered, which is what the Oregon defense does. You have a rusher who already made it into the backfield who can get on Booker if he keeps the ball or even go off if Wilson goes here. You have the outside edge runner kind of uh, staying here, staying home. So if whether Wilson keeps the ball or hands it off, he's able to kind of make that adjustment and, and tackle whoever has the ball. And this is what Oregon did. You know, it's a red zone play, third down, big play. And because Wilson lingered on here and Oregon was able to get into the backfield, they were able to stop the play. And you talked about USC needing a blueprint, but this isn't anything new for the Trojans. They saw it in a couple teams earlier in the season. They had Arkansas State and even Arizona State. Here's a play with the Sun Devils ran it. Uh, it ended up being a turnover here and returned 99 yards by Chris Hawkins. What happens here? Well, 
USC has been struggling to stop the run, really struggling to get into the backfield. But on this play, you saw Delvon Simmons really quickly get into the backfield. And, you know, Berkovici had no choice. Whether he handed off the ball or kept it himself, you already had a rusher here and Delvon Simmons in the middle to make the play. And this is what they need to be able to do against Utah to stop that play option. And as we see here, USC has not always been able to deal with dual threat quarterbacks too well historically. These are the numbers from last year. So it's kind of been different around the board with the passing and the running game aspect. But time for your pa favorite part of your segment. Give us a little pallor prediction. I know Vegas is favoring USC somehow over the number three team by three and a half points. Yeah, the line's a little off in my opinion. USC is very talented, but Utah comes into this game undefeated. They have one of the top defenses in the Pac-12 and they're one of the top teams in turnover margin in the country. So I think Utah, they don't make mistakes. USC is kind of prone to make mistakes. I think it's going to be a tough game, but I think Utah pulls it out, I'm going to say, 34 to 27. 34 to 27. All right, well, there you got it from Palo. And now we've got a special look for you from a pac 12 football analyst who shared his thoughts about this upcoming Trojans game. I think Utah, obviously, up, up front, they're very good on the defensive line. They're very good at stopping the run, but... That has been USC's strength all year long, and I don't think they've run the football enough. I think sometimes uh, they, they run the ball well, but they want to throw. And in this football game, you have to establish line of scrimmage. Uh, and even though they are facing a very good Utah run defense, I think they could run the ball with Jones and Madden and Justin Davis. Those three guys, uh, either they make it difficult for defenses. So I hope that USC in this football game uh, establishes the run, sticks with the run, wears them down. I think they can do it. And then... Uh, you know, that always sets up the play-action pass. It sets up uh, the plays they when they try to get the ball mm -hmm. to Dory Jackson and Juju Smith. So uh, you're going to have to run the football against Utah uh, somewhat if you want to beat them. This past week was a big one in the Pac-12, and with Utah coming up this week, I'm here with Aaron Glazier to take a look around the Pac-12. Aaron, what did you see from the rest of the Pac-12 this past weekend, and what does the rest of the season look like for USC? Well, the Pac-12 had some big games last week, especially with Stanford beating UCLA 56-35 and Utah taking down Arizona State by a score of 34-18. Oregon and Washington, there's also a big game, Oregon 26-20 over Washington. The Pac-12 continues to be both strong and competitive throughout the year, and it starts up top where the number three ranked Utah has yet to falter undefeated coming into the Coliseum this weekend taking on USC. Going forward for the Trojans, they have to have some help in order to win the South Division. Currently, they are both behind Utah and the two Arizona schools, so besides winning out the rest of the season, the Trojans must rely on some Utes losses. Games against both Washington and UCLA on November 7th and 21st pop up as potential opportunities for USC to see this, and also a November 21st game between the two Arizona schools will help open up some ground in the middle of the division because obviously someone will lose. In general, some magic will need to happen for USC to take the field December 5th in Santa Clara for the Pac-12 championship at Levi Stadium, but in the City of Angels, anything can happen for the Trojans. No doubt. It's definitely going to be interesting to watch coming up. The Utah game this week could be a turning point in the season, good or bad. It's definitely, obviously, a big game coming off the loss against Notre Dame. Thanks, Aaron. Now let's go to Connor on the couch with a special in-studio guest. So I'm joined now here by USC men's basketball junior forward, Nikola Yovanovich. Thanks for joining me today, Nikola. Yeah, thanks for having me. So before we really get into USC hoops, I want to talk to you about your summer. You did something special. You played for the Serbian national team going throughout South Korea. How was that? Uh, yeah, that's right. It was amazing. Uh, first of all, I was being followed by my Serbian national coach team uh, throughout the whole of my sophomore season. And I was inviting for the senior B national team, which is like right under the A. And uh, Serbia throughout history had really good basketball programs. And they didn't like guarantee me that I'm going to be like in 12 pairs who's going to go to the uh, World Tour University game in Guangzhou. So I needed to like make my spot in. And it was kind of hard. It was like 24 people coming in and every day was like super hard just like to go and practice twice a day in the morning and in the afternoon for like three hours and uh, that training camp was like for two three weeks and it was super hard but i made a team and uh, i was so fortunate to be on that team and go there and compete you were one of the youngest players on that team but you're one of the oldest players on this team with seven sophomores and freshmen what's it like being that older guy now uh, it means a lot uh, i'm trying to be like leader on and off the court try to lead by example and always do the right thing uh, I always tell, like, tell my teammates to like follow my example as well, and uh, and as we be as a team, uh, we're going to be able to win some games this year. Juggling that 15 practices a week and then also going to class, how difficult is that almost? Oh man, it's super hard, but I'm so excited for a season. I see season as a reward, so I'm like just thinking about the first game, like please start. 
but yeah my days are been crazy like i start every day almost like 7 a.m and end up at 8 p.m so it's pretty hard so last year you led the team in rebounding seven rebounds a game you had a 30 point game even what have you been working on specifically to improve your game going into the season uh, I was just trying to put uh, physical strength to be like more strong so I can be like a, have more weight impact in a, in a paint. I was doing a lot of shooting, post moves and all like inside out games. So I'm going to be able to impact in every segment of the game. And then from a team perspective, you guys kind of struggled last year, 12 and 20, but you had that big win in the Pac-12 tournament against ASU. What are your expectations and how are you guys working to improve going into this season? Uh, yeah, that's right. I think that game was a little preview for this season because uh, this year we didn't lose any players. We have all the guys returning and ple plus we got like two more freshmen coming in. We all got mature, stronger, experienced and I think throughout this work as we're getting better. So I think uh, uh, comparing to the other teams, the conference lost a lot of players to the NBA. So I think this year is going to be our year for sure. So on a little bit of a lighter note, non-basketball related, obviously you said you're from Serbia, you've kind of mastered English, but those two languages aren't the only ones that you know? Uh, yeah, that's true. I'm actually fluent in three languages. I'm fluent in French and of course Serbian is my first language. So when did, why did you take up French? Uh, well, my parents were kind of ambitious. So like when I was a kid, like uh, they put me in a French kindergarten and afterwards I just like went to uh, elementary and uh, high school, everything was in French. I was taking a bilingual classes and professors were straight out of France. So like their Serbian was terrible and the only way to communicate with them was through French. So that's how I learned it. <laughs> well, thanks for joining me today, Nicola. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Uh, you, honor. Can, you can make sure to catch Nicola and the rest of the USC men's basketball team when they tip off their season at home at the Galen Center on November 13th against San Diego. Switching gears to another team that plays in the Galen Center, the USC women's volleyball team reached 20-0 on Sunday with a win over Arizona. Also, congratulations to coach Mick Haley who notched his 900th Division I victory. Cooper, Fabio, this is only the fourth time the women of Troy have started 20-0. How has the team continued this run? Jackson, you're right. This is a team that had a, a bunch of question marks surrounding it entering this season with all the freshmen that were going to be involved, the replacements of players like Ebony Wabanu and having to really try and reinvent themselves. And we knew San Mauricio was something to look for, but there was such a question mark with the supporting cast. That's really been answered so far to this point in the season. Obviously a lot of time to go, but a lot of encouraging things as well. Yeah, I believe the result comes from a good team effort. It's player contributing. Sam obviously leads the team, but the role players have really stepped up recently. Samantha Bricio has continued to dominate the Pac-12, but other players have stepped up, like Taylor Whittingham, who received honors as the Pac-12 Defensive Player of the Week. Fabio, what other players have stepped up to get the team to 20-0 in the point where they're at so far this season? Well, I think Bailey Johnson has had an impressive season so far, being able to top the team in tough spots. She has the ability to play two different roles perfectly, allowing Coach Haley to always have three attackers in the front, giving junior setter Alicia Pitasegla and opposite hitter Brittany Abercrombie to be at top of the game. Going back to San Bruce, I think what really helped her is freshman Alex Ford taking pressure off of her and letting her save energy for the rest of the season. Victoria Garrick has also been impressed with her backline defense, helping junior libero Taylor Whittingham. Yeah, you mentioned Taylor Whittingham. That's someone who came, out, came back from last season as an honorable mention All-American, and she's really capitalized on that role and played a huge role in this USC defense. Lately come on strong, two huge matches this weekend against the Arizona schools. They'll need more of that from her going forward. And also Brittany Ambercrombie, the opposite, who stepped into a major role as a true sophomore this season, has done her job to take some pressure off while also not necessarily being spectacular, but very solid in every match. The women of Troy are almost halfway through their Pac-12 schedule, still sitting undefeated. And the last three times they were undefeated this far into a season, they went on to win the national championship. What are you guys expecting for this weekend against the Oregon schools and beyond? Well, Jackson, you mentioned that huge pedigree with three national championships the last three times they did something of this variety. But there are still a lot of question marks. They've obviously answered and been to the build at this point. But in such a, com a, a difficult conference like the Pac-12, six other ranked teams still at this point in the season, they're going to have their fair share of tests with, you know, throughout the next 12 matches. So given that and keeping that in mind, there's definitely still some mysteriousness around this team and whether or not they can reach that pinnacle. But you have to like what you've seen through them at this 20-0 point in the season, right, Fabio? Yeah, I believe as the season progresses, the team needs to keep up that strong defense. If they do that and continue to beat Simon offense, they could easily continue the run. The women's volleyball team has continued to dominate, but let's throw it over to Beverly Pham for a look at the rest of the USC sports. Thanks, Jackson. It's time to break down the latest in USC sports. Let's light the torch. 
Over the weekend, the men's and women's swimming and diving team combined to win 8 of 18 events in their home opener. The men's team defeated Hawaii 217 to 108.5. They were led by a pair of wins from junior Michael Damagla and now improved to 3-0 on the season. USC will host Cal State Bakersfield this Friday at 2 p.m. On to the women's team, the women of Troy fell to NC State and are up against Oregon State at home this Friday. Switching from the pool to the field, the USC women's soccer team are now 10-4-1 after defeating Oregon on the road in their best offensive performance of the season, with four goals coming from Jamie Fink, Nicole Mullen, Kayla Mills, and Amanda Rooney. Goalkeeper Sammy Jo Prudhomme tied her season-high total of seven saves for the team's sixth shutout this year. The Trojans are back at home this Saturday at 2 p.m. against Utah. Back to the water, USC men's water polo improved to 17-2 overall after a pair of big wins against Pepperdine at home and UC Santa Barbara on the road. With the wins, the Trojans remain undefeated in MP MPSF conference play. Nick Bell led the Trojans with two goals against the Waves and Blake Edwards scored three of the Trojans' six goals against the Gauchos. Yeah, just a little slow, I mean, coming off the start, I mean, what was it, 3-2 going into the half? We just, not that we made adjustments, we just stuck to our game plan running that all-out press defense, and then our offense eventually came and found its way. The team will be back on the road again this weekend to take on Pacific on Sunday. That's all from the USC Sports World this week. Now switching gears from the Trojans in the pool to the fans in the stands. Let's toss it over to Kristen for a social media recap. Thanks, Bev. The football team may have been on the road this weekend, but that didn't stop students and loyal Trojan fans alike from taking over social media. While you may have been mourning the heartbreaking loss against Notre Dame, I was busy skimming the feeds for the best of the best tweets and posts. So without further ado, here is your week in social media, Road Game Edition. There is no denying that it has been a rough week in the life of USC Athletic Director Pat Hayden. With the head coaching drama and a tough rivalry game on his hands, it's no surprise that all the stress finally got the best of him. At the Notre Dame game, Hayden almost collapsed on the sidelines. But don't worry too much as he seemed to be in good spirits on Sunday when he took to Twitter saying, Thanks for all the support. I checked out fine and am feeling great today. Proud of our effort versus ND. Came up just short. Beat the Utes. On a happier note, with the game on the road come plenty of road trip posts. Even though the game was nearly 2,000 miles away, students and alumni alike made the trip and braved the cold in South Bend. One recent alum, Olivia Dunow, shared her game day on Instagram saying, So much cold, so much not win. You got that one right, Olivia. And finally comes a tweet that perfectly captured the feelings of all USC fans who traveled to the game. On her plane ride home, junior Andy Jamal tweeted, How thankful am I to return to a city that is 72 degrees where I can feel my feet and only wear one layer of clothing. That tweet alone is enough evidence that though the Trojans may have lost on the field, we are always winners online. Well, that's all for me. Jackson, back to you. Thanks, Kristen. There were definitely a lot of SC students that used the trip to post on social media, including you. Our very own Kristen Lago survived the 32 degree temps and made it known with this pick saying, we may not have beaten the Irish, but at least I beat the cold. Hashtag fight on. And I do believe that was her most liked Instagram picture with just about 297. Wow. So that's all we got for you this week. Make sure to tune in next week when we talk about the family weekend game against Utah and women's soccer stretch back home. See you next time.